All right, so we want to thank you guys for joining us today for the Elite Athletes Recruiting Podcast. Uh, today, I got with me Coach Ray, uh, Coach Ray Johnson. He um, awesome guy, got a lot of knowledge in track and field. Um, so I'm really excited to be talking to him today. Uh, Ray, thanks for being on. Hey, thank you for inviting me, um, Coach Mike. Well, I'm looking forward to it. So why don't we just start off with just simple, easy question. Tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you into coaching? Okay, well, my name is uh, Raymond Johnson. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Um, you know, like I said, I went to, I ran track in college at Virginia State University from 1994 to 98. Um, I always had a love for track and field. Um, hey, I was a, I was a walk-on. So oh, wow. I worked hard and I got me a, a partial scholarship. Um, so I always love track, I love competition and love meeting people. Um, but while I was in school, I decided to also join the ROTC and I went through the program. I became a, I guess, commissioned as a second lieutenant. So I ended up serving 17 years and, you know, 17 years, seven months, retired as a major in the U.S. Army. And from there, um, wanted to do something else. And so after we, my wife said, after I took off one year, my wife said, hey, you should be a school teacher. I'm like, what? I just want to relax. Right. And so... Um, I started off as a, a substitute, you know, a, a, permit, a permanent substitute. Mm -hmm. And it was one day I was, you know, bef bef before the substitute even, you know, started, I had just transitioned out the military. Um, and my daughter at the time, she was in the sixth grade. And I was like, babe, you know, I, I said, I wonder if they need a volunteer track coach at the middle school. So I talked to the athletic director there. He said, hey, we need a coach. We need I'm a like, really? <laughs> And so from there, um, I was I was a volunteer, I, you know, a paid you know volunteer coach. But they paid me. They paid me. You know, it was non faculty, non faculty pay. Yeah. And so you know, at middle school, I mean, that's about maybe about two hundred and ten dollars, you know, a month. Right. And so I'm like, okay, I just I just love I love you know track. So my first year, um, I I, I took over as the girls track coach, and you know. You talking about a team that was like, you know, you know, it was like the bottom of the barrel. And right. so first year, um, I, I connected with another coach that was, you know, he had a, a child that was at the middle school at the time. Uh, me and Coach Pickett, we ended up, you know, building that team up from sixth place to fourth place in the conference. Mm -hmm. And we was able to kind of build, the, you know, bridge the gap because it was like, you know, there was a lot of, you know, you know, you're in middle school, you always got clicks. Girls always got the most right, clicks. Right. <laughs> So we had to bridge that gap. And so, you know, then you had to deal with all the other issues females did with. And they, they used to, they used to um, really play, you know, always play the, oh, I can't do this because. I'm like, and so I start investing in female mentors, uh, coaching mentors. Oh, yeah. uh, Demetria, Demetria Washington Davis. She was, uh, uh, she ran uh, her college track and field at University of South Carolina. But she was the, you know, she led her, college to their very first national championship in the history of you you know university of South carolina the gamecocks yeah and so she just said she said ray these are things that i mean actually when they go through those things they, they actually are it's better for them that's ah okay and so as i understood the the young ladies and you know and so within within the third year you know as the girls head coach we end up winning our first title in the history of the school oh wow and, and after that, it became residual year after year after year. So I left my third year. And then, you know, I was also, I was also coaching the boys. And so the boys, you know, they, they had won their first championship before I got there. And they're like, Coach, I know you knew, but the guys last year were fast. I said, guys, there's a new sheriff in town. Y'all y'all haven't seen nothing yet. And they won again, you know. And for now, we just, be, you know, we, we just built that winning pedigree at that middle school. And so I tell kids all the time, you know, I'm very big on Napoleon Hill. Yeah. You know, if you can achieve it, you can believe it. Right. And just, you know, start with that, you know, just defining the culture on um, the school I was at was very diverse. And we was able to, you know, my thing as a coach is understanding where everyone comes from and right. then being able to bridge that gap. And so everybody understand how to operate, you know, on the same drumbeat. Right. And so, you know, and just being able to relate to, you know, the middle schoolers, you know, I had a middle schoolers to whatever she watched, I watched, yeah. you know, and just integrate everything to our program. But 
that's a little bit about myself. I mean, I just love having fun, love motivating kids, inspiring them, you know, because especially, you know, from ages, you know, 11 through 14, they, they think they, they think you're like, you know, 24. And I'm like, y'all haven't even lived, you know, not right. even a quarter of a century yet. So. Right. Right. I noticed that where I coached all the way through with my oldest daughter. So, and I much, much more enjoy coaching the high school kids. You can be a little more aggressive with them. You can be a little more, uh, not, not just aggressive, but like you can be a little more truthful and honest, right? Um, or hard on them. You can just be a little more, more coach them up a little more. But yeah. the, the middle school age is such that like that malleable age. And I've now gone full circle where I'm coaching um, junior high football and lacrosse. Mm. And it's become an interesting, um, an interesting thing, like you said, because the middle schoolers are, you know, they, they're in this like weird stage of like, everything is awkward. Everything is growing. Things are sprouting out that I didn't know about. And um, they think they're 24 mentally. They think they've got some maturity, but at the same time, they're still very vulnerable. Middle school kids are awesome. Um, you, you, it, you could probably speak to it. it takes a little bit of extra effort to try to communicate with them because they they don't always get it the first time and it really, right. you, really you really have to do you know you have to do your work to get, to get something and, through and one of the biggest things i have to uh, give credit to is my mentors um, i'm also with a, a club team here in fayetteville the fayetteville um flyers yeah. And so with them, you know, we have, you know, a lot of experience um, track coaches and they say, hey, you know what, before you do anything else, right, you should go to USA track and field, the level, you know, the certification courses. Right. So after my after my first year as a girls coach at the middle school level, I went to that course down in uh, University of South Carolina mm -hmm. and I really gained even more knowledge of, you know, track knowledge and came back. A champion even you know 10 times right. um then i decided i wanted to go and invest my knowledge and and i went and took the level two uh right. certification for youth specialization you know and so i'm specializing in youth you know and i want to understand how you know you know when it comes to you know sport you know youth sports psychology you know is a child um is is, is it an intrinsic motivator or extrinsic right. you know how you motivate them and so there's a lot of key things as a coach you want to understand for you know you know for your athlete right right so you said you love track what do you what is it what is it that you know uh compels you to want to share your knowledge of track with the young people today is it just your love of the sport is it like what draws you to that i think what draws me towards it is i use my son and daughter for instance uh, when you see when you see um, a talent, and you can say, "Hey, I, I want to, you know, I want to take your talent to the next level. Be able to give, you know, sh give them some tools, some small tools that can, you know, bring the best results out of them. Yeah. You know, that makes my day. Or when my daughter, you know, she's at, at that level where you know college coaches are looking at her, and or or even any of my athletes, I'm like, "Hey, my goal, my biggest goal, what makes me excited is to get you that scholarship." Mm -hmm. And I achieved that, you know, I, I, we achieved that dream. You know, my, one of my dreams was, hey, when I moved to the middle, not the middle school, but the high school level is to get the athletes to the scholarships. And we got our first scholarship athlete this past November. She signed with Winston-Salem State. Oh. So we was very excited about that. And, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, just, um, just going back to just the love, just being able to, I, I'm just a people person. I'm a human relator. And, you know, I just love um, being able to you say, hey, you know, if, it's, if it's someone that's like, if it's a, a kid like my, my son that's nine years old right now, mm -hmm. you know, how can I tell them to uh, lift the knees up? So doing certain uh, activity that allows them to, you know, do those technical things. Right. You right. know, because they're not going to understand the, all right, make sure. And then my son, he's a little, well, he's, he'll, tell, he'll tell me, he said, dad. I just, I just dorsiflex my foot. So now I'm, I'm tapping the, the ball. So, okay. That's awesome. So, 
So a little stuff like that. But you know, and I use and I use little terms like easy peasy, lemon squeezy, you know, things right. that relate to them. Um, you know, you know, going back to the Dorsey Flex and say, point your punch it, point your toes to the sky, you know, you know, give them different shapes of their legs or their arms, how their arms should be, like the shape of an L and swiping through. Right. You know, little things like that. And they say, oh, okay. Or uh, nursery rhymes when we skip. So a little, I just like, right. it's like bringing life to them. Bring it, making it more app, um, understandable and applicable. I want to circle back to some of the technique stuff in a little bit, but I'm really interested in your idea of, um, or your wisdom to bring in mentors. How difficult was that to get people involved in that as mentors? And like, what caused you to do that? Was it just because you said, uh, you know, I've reached my capacity or I, I need to get more advice? Like that, I think that's like really interesting. Um, that, that's really interesting that you're, if, if the way I understand it, you're like connecting these mentors with your, with your athletes. So they kind of are there as guides or, you know, along the way, mm -hmm. not necessarily yeah. coaches. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I call myself a coachable coach. And so that coach, there's coaches out there like, I, I got this. I got me personally. Right. I'm a coachable coach. I, I'm a, I'm a, every, right. I'm a daily learner. And if there's something I don't know, I'm going to put the athlete with someone that do know, you know, and I'd be very cautious of who I put them, you know, who I surround them with. Right. Because, um, you know, you know, sometimes people are not in it for the right reason. Right. And so I've, I find those coaches that we, we have the same, we on the same uh, wavelength and we just go from there, but and understanding that, and, I, and, and, you know, I just be walking around every day and everybody, and everybody say, Hey, you know, Raymond Johnson, I'm like, huh? <laughs> you know, yeah, it's me, but I, I just, it's just something, you know, how Deion Sanders got that it factor. Right. I just feel like I got that coaching it factor where it's just like, I mean, to me, it's just like people are people, and I just want to go and just make sure everybody get what they need and be successful. That I'm telling you what, that is fantastic. That um man, I'm glad to learn that. That's cool. That's I think we talked about this when we when we got together in a previous life. I was a youth minister and um, I've always worked with youth. I, that's part of who I am. And I think that's part of what the coaching comes into. So I remember working with a youth minister and I had, a, I said one time, I think we had had like 14 different mentors working with our youth in our church and same philosophy. It's like, I'm a, I'm, I realize that different kind of people need different kind of people. Right. And and I'm only, my gift set is only so, so vast or so, you know what I mean? Um, and there's students that can connect with other people. And I think that's like, what a, like, that's brilliant, man. That's a, I bet, do your parents appreciate that? Do your, oh man, athletes appreciate that? Like, what kind of feedback have you gotten from that experience? Um, my, my parents, they just they continue to, you know, be the better version of yourself. Yeah. Um, athletes, you know, and I can tell when say for instance, I have a whole season with the athletes. Sometimes you can tell when athlete just had a, just a, too much of you. Then I say, Hey, I recommend this coach for you based off your personality or right. this coach for you based on your personality, because sometimes every coach is not fit for, right. you know, for the athlete, for certain athletes. Right. Um, so some, some, some athletes can deal with a, a hard knocks coach, you know, Yep. Some can't, you know. Um, and even with my kids, um, like Holly, she has her own jumps coach. Everybody said, You train her? I said, Nope. I yeah, there's a time where you had to let go and let God do his thing. <laughs> so, you know, and even my son, he, he's right now, he's still connected with me because he's with, you know, with our age group 12 and under. Right. But when he turns 12, then he'll graduate to coach. You know, we have a, we have a coach Mike here in Fayetteville. Uh -huh. he'll, he'll work with we would work with that group because he, he really goes even more in, you know, technical detail about, you know, running and things like that. It goes more into the sciences, at, you know, how the body moves. He's a, he's a, he's a master of biomechanics. Wow. So, so you mentioned Holly, amazing athlete, 
super good kid. That means you're a parent. Let's talk about being a parent of an athlete uh, or coaching your kid. Like, how do you deal with that? Like, oh yeah, <laughs> hey, that's a that you know what that is a journey in itself because Holly started running at the age of ten. Mm-hmm. Okay, and at age ten, you know that's when I was just like just being just strictly the parent, and then. Um, as I start, you know what? I said, maybe I just start a little coaching here with her. And so it was going easy. And then I realized I started going a little overboard. Yeah. And I remember we moved, we, we was here in North Carolina. We was out in the yard doing some, I think we were running some, like some 100 meter sprints or something. And we just doing just regular activity. And all of a sudden, Holly just, she just kind of, she kind of leans on the, on our car and everything. And then our next door neighbor said, what is, what is uh, Raymond doing over there? He says, he killing his chest. <laughs> I tell my wife, I'm like, I said, Holly just went outside on your, on your car and did, and just like the whole, the neighborhood think I'm an uh, abusive parent or something. <laughs> <laughs> and she was just tired. So I'm like, you know what? Um, I'm telling you so many stories of like, I remember her first time at that four by four made it to nationals. And the coach said, hey, um, you know, y'all made it to national, but the times that y'all ran, it, he didn't want to leave them, have them going to like, I think we was going to like California or something. And there were teams that were running like really fast. And just mentally, if they would have been on, they would still be on the track as, as that team would have passed them, they'll circle them. Right. So he saw it as a mental, said, hey, no, y'all are still champions, but we're not going to go. Holly Hart dropped. I'm like, Coach, you just don't know. I got to deal with this on a long ride back home. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was one of them. And I said, hey, Holly, let's go. You know, let's get some ice cream. Let's talk it over. Right. You know, right. going to buy a Barbie doll or something. So, you know, just kind of, you know, and then as, as I understand, you know, that parent and coach relationship, I had to scale back. So I scaled back a whole lot. I said, you know what, I'm going to just, play a little reverse psychology here with Holly. And so from, you know, any time I coach her from middle school and now high school, but when practice is over, I don't talk about practice. That's awesome. And she like, and I remember we, we was in a championship meet her, her middle school. And so she walked up to me, she said, coach. I'm like, coach. <laughs> I never, you know, I didn't expect her. I thought she was say dad, but she said, coach. Mm-hmm. And so that's when I knew that scaling back is, is, is was very important for me. And it just letting us have that daughter, you know, that daughter father relationship, just talking about things, you know. I think there's a, it's a cool bond because I coached my daughter for a long time and I coached her by default. I never intended to coach my daughter. Um, I had just ended up coaching and she, you know, she was, that's what the sport that she liked to play. So I'd never really intend. I wasn't one of those parents. That's like, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure my kid's the best in the world. Right. Right. uh, Kind of thing. Um, But we had a special bond and I think that's really cool. And I, I, I have the same kind of thing. There's, you draw the line outside of competition. You're not coach. um, You're not coach. And you don't talk about those things. You let, Mm -hmm. you let it go. Um, It's not the easiest thing to do because as a coach, you mentioned a couple of times, making a better version, reaching your best potential. I think that's why we get into coaching because we see the potential in other people and we want them to achieve the highest. And when they don't, it's at least for me, it's hard not to say anything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's hard not to go you know, <laughs> you could be yeah. doing this a little better. And, uh, but it, it's still, uh, now that Madeline is on the college, we have a different relationship because she can contact me and, and tell me what kind of stuff she's going through on the athletic side. And I can understand and we can, um, and then we also got the dad, the dad daughter thing. I think that's really cool. Yeah. How do you juggle being a parent and a coach? Like, how, what do you do? Do you get a lot of support around you? Does your wife help a lot? 
do you just burn the candle at both ends? What, how do you juggle that responsibility, those responsibilities? Yeah. yeah you know, and that's a good question. Cause, um, there'd be some, you know, we, before I started the coaching, um, which was, which was like back in 2015. And so since, since it was my wife's idea to have me go into the school system and then became with coaching, we had the conversation about, you know, what it takes. So just having that, you know, communication and being able to plan out our, you know, our week, mm -hmm. you know, plan, you know, plan out the season, making sure we had time during the summers. Cause like, even when Holly and Raymond run summer track, anytime we travel, we also make it a vacation wherever we travel to. Like oh, I know, you know, so like for instance, um, nationals for USA track and field will be in Jacksonville, Florida. So we know based off of that, we're going to take that whole week. Um, you, you know, you have uh, St. Augustine, Florida, which is about an hour away from it. Very historical um, city. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's some other places that, you know, and attractions to, um, you know, tour in Jacksonville. So little things like that, you know, just still being able to draw the line between coaching and family. Uh, because one thing about me is like, even with, you know, the club scene, we can go throughout the whole summer and mm -hmm. then I like, Hey, I need to take a break. So I wouldn't coach cross country because I wouldn't want to burn myself out even completely because we really travel and everything. So it's not, you know, we still had to, you know, as coaches, we had to, you know, take, you know, self care, right. you know, and, you know, and just, you know, and tell my, and I, and I tell my wife and I, I forgot to add this on earlier, but going back to, um, to, you know, that, you know, that communication with your, your child as a coach and dad, because my mentor had told me, he said, hey, because his daughter ran track, you know, for him for almost like 10 years before she went to college and then she decided she wanted to dance. Mm -hmm. But he was like, he said, just be careful on the type of words you use. Instead of saying, you know, you could do better, use word like, just give a little more effort, you oh. know words have meaning to it so it's not as harsh you know saying you, you know you could do better than that or just say hey, you know what you could have just showed a little more effort that i think it would have you would have did this this and this mm -hmm. and then it'll come out a different way you know understand holly's more of um she's type of athlete you got to tell her good job you know and then she's growing up now it's like i got this you know so it was all you know growing that confidence Right. You know, and it takes time. So from age 10 to now 17, 17 is like, I got this. I can really do this now, you know. Right. Whereas my son, he's like, hey, I'm at 10. I got this. I'm, when I go to the meet, I'm going to be number one. <laughs> I'm going to be number one. I saw the Facebook post on him, man. <laughs> yeah. So, and so, like you said, we, we don't, like you said, we don't, we don't try to compare the kids because, you know, I got, you know, the third back here. He was like, Holly, I did this. And if she didn't have a good day, I'm like, all right, just cool down your words. You you really you really violate the 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 the, the process of words here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. Like I think you said again something neat with like communication. Um, I remember in softball we talked. One of our players was was slow. And and we, instead of saying, hey, you can hustle more to get to that ball or you're, you're not getting there, you're, you're getting there too slow, dang it. It's like, hey, you got to move with more sense of urgency. There you go. And I that, that still sticks in my mind because for that kid, it was all of a sudden like, okay, I'm not slow. I just, whatever it meant to her, to her this was a softball player, but whatever it meant to her, got her to move quicker. Mm, and it, and you elicited like you you hit it like when you um when you choose different words man like when you choose when you choose to use very um indicting phrases you're gonna you're gonna elicit a result it might not be a result you want you right know, or it's detrimental i'm slow how many kids have we heard like i'm not oh, fast yeah. enough i'm not big enough i'm too heavy mm -hmm. i'm too um you know, and it's like, once you start putting that negativity out there, that's hard to overcome. It's hard. It, to is. Overcome. it is. Touch on that. You're, you coach boys and girls. I've coached boys and girls. I'll, I let everybody know in the world, I would rather coach girls than boys 
any day and twice on Sunday. <laughs> I just think they're more coachable. And I think, yeah. but I love, I love being around the boys because you can, they're, I love both of it. But like in terms of coaching and instruction, to me, if I had my choice, I would coach girls. Yeah. But what are you like? What are you just like? What kind of dynamics do you see? What kind of things in terms of track? You know, and in, in trying to work with both boys and girls, what do you see? Well, I remember, I remember my first year at, at, at the high school level. Well, as a head coach, the, you know, well, I could even go back. My assistant, you know, I had I had two assistant, you know, stints at one high school. It was it was pretty well. Uh, they received me well because they were kids that were coming from the middle school that I already coached. Mm -hmm. But then I went to another school afterwards, and it was a little hard getting you know getting to you know getting to them. And so I was like, huh, something that and it it was a lot of things that was not clicking with the athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a little discipline here and there, but like I said, we, we still did okay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I had the opportunity now where I'm at. Um, and I could tell you the first, the first 15 weeks, cause I brought myself and another coach over to assist me and just the buy-in, you know, um, yeah. it's like, this is how they, this is how we did it last year. I'm like, well, this is how we're going to do it this year. And right. so just understanding the philosophy, you know, because I have a coaching philosophy that we go by and I and I use it when I was at the middle school level. And I tell them, I said, we will, we work and we win, but we have to, to get to those things. We have to improve daily, getting better daily every day. And so once, you know, because, you know, middle school kids, you know, they're like, oh, that, that was a great chant. High school was like, oh, that's lame. Uh, All that's right. Cool. Yeah. Too, too cool for that, right? Yeah, it's so cool, you know, I'm like, but y'all need it. And eventually I got that, they bought into it mm -hmm. and it got better throughout. And so, but like I so said, on the boys' side, I'm telling you, I was dealing more with like, you know, I had I had some top seniors. They already, they already knew it all. They like 18 years old. And I'm like, hey, you still, there's still room for improvement. Mm -hmm. But on the girls' side, it was a little more, they were a little more open. Mm -hmm. You know, you still had some that probably, you know, will follow what some of the senior guys are doing because, you know, that's, the, you know, they were the seniors, right. you know, but overall at the end, at the end of the day, they all, they all were like children to me. And they said, you know, they, you know, they felt like I was their father. Yeah. You know, because a lot of them didn't have, you know, fathers or didn't know their father. And so that's the, they like said, that's the thrill of everything. Um, just the passion of just being able to be more than just a coach. Right. Um, because, you know, like I said, they, they're, they're, the kids are, they, they're still kids. Oh, you yeah. know, <laughs> they're still kids. But the dynamic, like I said, you're right. Um, girls, you know, they, they just, they catch his own to things. Got, the good thing about guys is if they don't get it right, you can kind of jack them up a little bit. Right. You know, and, uh, and then, but on the same token, I remember like this past summer, this one one of my experiences came up to you and said, Coach, I just want to apologize to you. I thought, what you talking about? He said, I'm sorry, because I didn't buy in like I could have. Because he said, if I would have bought in, I, I would have been in the top three in the state for, for the 60. I said, and so now, as, and it's all about maturity. Because right. girls mature faster than boys. And when they when it's when they get when the boys light bulb click. Then they're like, ah, I, I, w I was doing this all wrong. Coach Johnson was right, he you know, but right. yeah. <laughs> but I had, sometimes you had to let them figure it out on yourself. They may have to fall in their face before they say, oh, you know what? That was mud. I that got the, this all muddy, the dirty my clothes. Now I'm ready to get clean and get refreshed and listen. Right. And be coach so. Being coachable is huge. Being coachable mm -hmm. is huge. Yeah. So. Let's talk. I want to. I want to pick your mind as a track coach, and I ask this to some of my other coaches, like with um, where there's a travel or more like an elite level, baseball or softball. There's you know we there's the next level beyond high school. So um, and you talked a little bit about the younger guys or younger athletes. Sorry, uh, boys and girls. 
Um, tell us just like if a, a normal listener wasn't really familiar with the track and field scene, obviously you have seasons outside of your high school. Tell us a little bit what that looks like and what would you recommend for the parent who has an athlete that's an, that's a, that's a strong runner or, or, or in track and field, when would be a good time to get that person into maybe a next level elite kind of competition? So you're talking about like a, like a, someone that's playing a different sport? No, just like an, like a, like a track kid that's going to compete outside of the, the typical school sports season, like a, like a running club or a running oh, okay, club. Okay, okay. Like elite stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I highly recommend, you know, athletes to run out, you know, out, you know, um, in the summertime or even now, even with COVID, I even talk about COVID. Right. I'm telling you, COVID has really separated the those that really want it and those that don't want it. That's interesting. And it's, I mean, I'm really being honest because um, that I had some elite athletes that they thought they they thought they had what it takes to go to the next level, mm -hmm. but on the same token, they're not doing those things that's going to take them there. Uh, they uh, worship jobs over work, over, over getting the, their, their athletic work in. Right. And so I'm like, you know, I have nothing against jobs, but I say you have a whole lifetime to work. You know, if you're trying to get to that next level, go and go, go to a club, track club, go, go and invest in a coach that's going to really get you to the next level. Um, the good thing about some of the coaches that I'm affiliated with, they don't charge a dime to train. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you that's know? amazing. That's great. You know, and so by saying that, um, this was this has been a great opportunity for Holly. I use Holly, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, ever since March of 2020, Holly has trained with her jumps coach from, from, from March all the way to present. And I've seen, you're talking about someone that has progressed, got stronger. Um, I know I saw something we were talking about how to get fast. Well, Holly got fast through building her hip flexors, getting them stronger. Yeah. And so understanding those little things. And so as athletes, when they, they want to go to that, you know, run outside their, outside their season, they had to under, identify those strengths and weaknesses because when they go and train there, that's where those coaches really going to, specify on those things that they can get better at right but if they don't then it's like okay they're gonna be running just like they did their freshman or sophomore or junior year then when senior year come around they're like oh I, coach uh, when the next week we're going to or is it any college out i said well you haven't done anything so i cannot go out to a coach and say hey look out for this girl you know look out for this guy or girl because you haven't shown me anything. I'm not going to lie about you yeah. running times or jumping a, a certain distance that, you know, because you didn't, you didn't take the time and work on your own because I said, my name matters, not being selfish, but because when I talk to those coaches, right, they have jobs, they have to eat too. Exactly. So if I say this person runs a 10 one, but they run like a 12 one boy, I'm like, they're like, coach, what are you saying? You, you just lied to me. You, so I, I'm not that way. I, I would oh. feel horrible. Right. So the, the purpose, very, I very recommend parents if they, if they, if their star athlete is good in a sport because we have a lot of multiple athletes that yeah. you know, compete basketball, track, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if they are all right in basketball, but great in track and they're a junior, they need to be getting more focused on what's going to take them to the next level. Right. And understanding that basketball or whatever, they love playing it, that's not what's going to give them that, you know, save their parents money out of their pocket so the school right. they want to go. Right. You know? uh, it, I, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in narrowing down working on your strengths and um i like athletes that are multi-sport athletes but i also feel like you know eventually you like you said you 
you're going to do that in life, man. You're going to, I'm good at this. I'm not so great at that. I need to follow this path. And that's my, going to be my career or my interest or whatever. And it's okay to do that in sports too. And I think there's a lot of wisdom there, but I think you're interesting. What, what you said too is, um, and I had a similar conversation with a coach this morning in, a, in another interview. And that coach said the same thing. COVID was a blessing in that sense that it's taught my, it's, you separated those kids who really want to keep working hard um, versus those who have used it as an excuse. And you've seen, you've mm -hmm. seen a lot of attrition or we see That's a right. lot of attrition because you know what? It's hard now. It's, it's, if you're not com competing, if you don't have as many opportunities for competition, um, whether that's baseball, softball, track, I mean, track meets have suffered, I'm sure. Um, football games have suffered. Oh, yeah. An, an athlete can't just go, well, I can't play. It's no fun. You know, I guess I don't have to go to the weight room. I guess I can stop training. I can stop, you know, I can stay up and watch watch the TV and play video games all night and still have this idea that, yeah, I'm going to get recruited. I'm going to go play college sports. Yeah. And it's not going to help it. Talk to us about um, like your athletes, especially on the high school, how are they dealing with that recruiting side of, or like just that, how COVID's affected them and, and their season. Do you feel like they are handling it well? Like just kind of, observations about what's going on with our high school athletes well you know that's a great question there um from from my point of view there there's some that's handling it okay and they have that support system at home mm -hmm. you know and then there's some that that they may have the support system at home but they it goes back to them say hey this i can't do this no more and it's making excuses instead of just trying to find a way out of no way. Um, when this when this hit Holly, because you know Holly missed out her whole sophomore season, outdoor season. Right. And she said, Dad, what what are we gonna do? And I like, well, Holly, that's um, you know, your jumps coach, he's he's he said, Hey, let's go out and do this, let's do this, do this. Then I said, you know, since you say you have an interest in uh college, you know, wanna wanna compete in college. Let's look at some, you know, different, you know, rec recruiting um, uh, agencies. And like I said, I was, re I was referred to um, CSA by, you know, by Joy. And I'm like, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And so parents, like I said, these are things that if you, if you have a star athlete, these are things you need to do. You know, look at investing in, in, a, in some type of recruiter that, you know, they had the experts that can pinpoint your child to, right. you know, their needs. <laughs> Because, you know, there's kids, there are athletes out here right now that say, hey, you know, I want to go to LSU, Georgia, Alabama, <laughs> you know. And, you know, being realistically thinking that that's everybody don't go to those schools, you know. You really got to be elite, especially on the track scene. Right. Uh, and, you know, almost like literally you, you're ready to run professionally, you know, getting ready for the Olympics. And, and so – it goes back to, and I have all the kids write down their goals, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so starting with Holly, I told her write her goals down because even with this COVID, we still have to have certain goals. Right. If, if, if you don't, if you don't do another track meet or whatever, you still have to write down your goals. And so goal, goal setting is key. Mm -hmm. And I wish more kids, you, you know, took the time and wrote down their goals because it will kind of, it kind of ease the, the burden of oh, COVID is struck. My life is over. There's nothing else out there for me to do, but when which it actually is. And so when, when we start coming with measures in place for COVID, as we continue to find different things of how to run different venues, things are starting to open up. Like since we've been to like during the summertime, we went to like three different track meets. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we just do our research and, uh, you know, it's, you know, research, you know, it, it goes to like knowledge is power. It's so right. much research, right. you know, so, and so if you, 
Do not try to, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Knock on the door, open it up. You can, you can, you can be like this. Uh, you can, there's two, there's two definitions of fear. You can uh, face everything and run away from it, or you can face everything and rise to the occasion. And so we take the second option and yeah. continue. To, and so that's what I tell parents and say, hey, just take that second option. Let's go for it. Because at the end of the day, if you if you just go through that door, it might be a blessing right behind it. And it don't have to be, it could be anywhere. Cause mm-hmm. when I when I start talking to like, you know, you and just in general, I'm like, man, it's a it's a home for everybody. Yeah. But you still have to work hard to get to that home. Right. You, know, right. you gotta put in the work. Sure. Academics, it don't matter what what division it is, academics matters. And then everything else after that, you know. But yeah that's cool so tell us like you mentioned a little bit earlier speed is a premium for every athlete you can't teach speed um well you can teach speed but a lot of kids are gifted with speed some are faster than others i believe if you work hard you can you can improve there's always incremental improvements um just as an observation what do you see um, some areas that athletes should work on. If an athlete was listening to this podcast and said, Coach Ray, how do I get faster? What would you recommend to your to that athlete? I would tell athletes to work on their uh, hip mobility. Their hip mobility. Because um, a skillful runner runs through their hips. And that goes to for any sport. Running through your hips. Not running through your knees, but running through your hips. Um, building... You know, for instance, if you're trying to get fast, you want to increase your fast twitch muscles, mm-hmm. you know, go, you know, just so you can, you know, get to go. If it's if it's baseball with the 60, if it's football with the 40, you know, soccer with the quick burst, you know, off the breakaway or the, you know, with, with track with the 100 or, or what have you, or the, just the first five steps for explosiveness, you want to be able to, you know, increase fast twitch build your hip flexor muscles, just be mobile, you know, um, and just, and, and, the, and the good, the best thing about it, about this running thing, understand how to run, you mm-hmm. know, and I just, I'm out here running, but just how to run, right. uh, you know, there's so many different angles of running. Uh, I, I love the, uh, the, the art and science of track, you know, because it, it, it feeds into all the other sports. Mm-hmm. Because you you still need to run, you know, certain angles. If, if for the forty, uh, we talk about proper shin angles, being able to you know, shin to move at a certain way. So when you when you when you take off, you're already at a at a forty five degree angle coming up, and then you just fight, you know, running through, just digging, 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 being patient in your drive phase, and then just increasing that speed throughout throughout distance. So you know the the biggest thing. Um, athletes work on your core a strong core yeah that that, that posterior chain strengthen those things up they the little things if you if you strengthen the, if you strengthen the little things everything else would would, would be like cake your cake right. well those are great tips those are awesome tips because i think everybody well, I think there's a lot of kids that just aren't naturally fast and then they end up, they say, well, I can't get any faster. And I always think that you can, you can do things to improve. Um, the other thing is I think every athlete should get a running coach mm-hmm. because like you said, it feeds into so many other sports and I can't tell you how many kids I've seen, you know, uh, they run side to side, their, their arms are flailing and just small little changes in function and technique and it can shave off tenths of a second and it helps Absolutely. tremendously. So I, I'm a big believer in getting a running coach. Um, so that's why we have to have guys like you, man, <laughs> to help us out. Um, we're gonna wrap up this interview. Uh, I appreciate you, your time. Um, but as we kind of wrap up, if there's one thing, one topic that you would have liked to talk about or that you thought about, but I didn't ask about, what would that be? Um, you know what? I, I really, huh, that's a good question. You got me thinking like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, you know what? I don't know. I mean, maybe like right. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a diehard Lakers fan. Mm-hmm. You know, LA Lakers fan, and I just want to know how LeBron James just continue, you know, on with his. He just has this level. He just stays up as like the you know like the you know the best every year. So that's something you know awesome to talk about. Maybe like, hey, oh, my son got something. Oh, I don't know. He said something. I couldn't hear him. <laughs> but okay. just um, ask him to say it one more time. Say it one. You, you can say it out loud. You're on. You got it. From keeping kids to burn out. Oh, oh, he had a good one. Um, he said, um, talking about kid burnout. You know, athletes burning out. Yeah. I, yeah. Look, yeah. Let's. We can talk about those two things because I think one. I think it's amazing to to see how can elite athletes continue to up their game, no matter what level. And I think that's a key that you talked about of uh, trying to, you know, making the best version of yourself. How do we balance that with keeping kids from burnout? You know, when do, you know, we kind of talked about that. When is an appropriate age? Um, and when is appropriate age to, to start those kinds of activities? One, making sure that the, the athlete is, doing the sport because they want to do it, not because mom and dad want them to do it. I think that's a big part of burnout. Like, um, and then I think there's telltale signs of an athlete that an athlete that enjoys the sport and does it because they love it and not because their parents or just does it because they want to be better. Those are parent or those are athletes that are willing to do the extra little things. Yeah. That's not true. You don't get burned out doing the things you love. That's I mean, true. I guess like, like you can burn, you can, what is it? You can burn out or fade away is the old song or something like that. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, you could, you could find some negative things in life that you love to do and you can do them so much to become detrimental. But we're talking about in a sport. I think if you love that sport and you really love it and you really enjoy it, mm-hmm. practice, practice isn't an albatross that's hanging around your neck practice is something you enjoy training is something you enjoy and i i think i see a lot of kids forced to play because mom and dad want you know they want to have a kid on the baseball team or they want to have a kid on the track team and they do it they do it for them they try to vicariously live through their kids and that's a crazy place yeah, very crazy <laughs> that's a crazy i also think that we um we, there are some sports where kids start way too early and you let me know if you feel the same way, but like when a kid is, when a kid is 14 and he's played 10 years of soccer, <laughs> cause he started at four years old, it's kind of like, no wonder why the kids burned out, you know, um, or, or doing the elite things too early and doing these competitions at eight year, eight years old. And an mm-hmm. athlete is like, I am, I, I don't want it. You know, I give up my summers. I give up my holidays and all that kind of stuff um, to go run track. And I want to be a kid too. I think there's, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about like, burnout? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, 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 we, me and my wife, we really monitor that. <clears throat> and it comes a time when I, you know, I tell Raymond, he, he pushes me to do things he like that like uh last year it was december i think it was december of last year he said dad i want to play football i said okay so then you know i said well i'm not this expert on football so i need to start looking for coaches that can get him mm-hmm. you know give him the skill hone the skills so i started with one coach and he did you know because raymond at the time he said i want to be a receiver and a, and a db so took him one coach and he taught him how to, you know, you know, you know, uh, maneuver around the cones and everything else like that, and do the figure eights, you know, all the different drills, all the agility drills that they, you know, the receivers and the corners do. And so he, he just, he picks up very, he picks up very fast and he got it. Mm-hmm. So from there, he said, 
he also said that I want to be a quarterback. So that same coach is like, oh, he's not ready to be a quarterback yet. He's too small. So Raymond's like, don't tell him he's too small to do anything. <laughs> I am not. Gotcha. So we decided to switch coaches because we, we saw, you know, it was a better coach as far as like working with youth. And it was other youth surrounded by him. So Raymond said, hey, I want to um, learn how to play quarterback. So the, so the coach taught him, you know, the fundamentals. And so now Raymond's like, I, I really like this quarterback. Man. That's okay. And so <clears throat> he did, he did try to go on to, he did, he did play travel ball for organization and, you know, things didn't work out <clears throat> like we thought it was, but and that's okay. He got some experience anyway, but on the same token, you see how, you had to be very careful about certain things <laughs> when it comes to coaches and things like that. You know, the things be feeding in your head and it's like, am I'm good or, and so Raymond's like that. I know I'm, I'm great. I said, that's, that's the right ment- mindset to have. Just keep on working hard. Mm-hmm. And so he just, we just said we were going to take a break from doing competitive football until you turn about like age 12. Cause like over here, I mean, from eight, seven six you know and up they play football all year round don't give the body a time to rest you know i've seen kids get concussion minor concussions and the parents say oh he don't have a concussion and i'm like you i mean it gets to, it gets bad when it comes to football so right he he said his stuff he said that that's wait till i turn by at least 12 you know i give my time you know give him give him time to even just train more on Mm-hmm. All the fundamental things he needed to know. I mean, he know how to read. You know, he understanding defenses and offenses. That's okay. You keep on learning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a smart kid. So my thing is, I said, well, that's in the summertime. Let's pick up. Let's get some golf clubs. Just go out there and work. You know, swinging and stuff. You know, work some other parts of your muscle, because every sport, you know, feeds into another sport. And in the same token, it's like he'll be, you know, he'll be, you know, very um, diverse in everything as far as body movements and everything. He's not just playing football and just doing one thing. Right. He, you know what I mean? So. I totally agree with that. I totally, I, I didn't start. Michael started playing football at 11. He played flag football before that. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at this year. Flag. Right. And as <laughs> I had this conversation with a a high school coach many, many years ago. And just from my line in in prep star and with the recruiting, I see way too many kids with injuries really early, 15, 14 year olds with ACL injuries and stuff like that. And a lot of it becomes, like you said, their bodies are worn down. They don't, if you do the same thing over and over, your body becomes conditioned to that. And then when you do something different, it creates an adverse result. Um, you know, families don't, people don't realize that. And like you touched on giving the multiple sports teaches their body, different mobilities, different ways to do things, different, um, skill sets, and it develops different muscles. And I think that helps an athlete all the way on. So my, my philosophy was let's start them, let them learn the game, let them learn for football, for this example, let them learn the game, um, in a competitive environment, but it's not as physical. Um, and mm-hmm. then if they, if they like, they understand the game and the game, they get a game IQ, it makes it a much more better and more fun experience when you put on pads because football, not- football is a violent sport. It is. <laughs> and, it, and I'm not saying violence as in like, you know, rough and tumble. Well, it is rough and tumble, but I'm not, you know, it, the reason it's the reason I say that is because you could get a kid that's nine years old or eight years old and have a bad collision mm-hmm. that's a result of two kids who cannot control their bodies. That's um, right. And and that one of those kids, more than likely, if not both, are going to say, I don't want to play this anymore because I didn't like that experience. I don't know right. why this happened to me. Yeah. And I'm not saying anything against younger programs i'm just saying that's what i've chosen to do with my kids give them the game iq give them the experience and again i think they'll they'll excel if they understand the game more and how they're supposed to move and 
<laughs> move and what to avoid and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's the same as, I mean, like it's the same as track. If you just take a kid in your fashion and say, hey, go run, eventually he's going to get to a point where the guys who are more technical are going to smoke him because they've got the technique and they've got the mental understanding of the game, the technical understanding of the game, the physical, the, the, all of those things. Um, man, you're so smart. You've got a lot of good ideas. You got a lot of good ideas, but I think like, again, what do you think? Like, why is it? Why does LeBron keep up in his game? He's what thirty six now. Thirty. Yeah, thirty six. Thirty six. At thirty six, thirty six. He'll be thirty seven this year. Um, like I said, you know, he, like I say, he, he invests in his craft. He invests in his health. Yeah. Um, I mean, when they when he say he invests like a million dollars, I don't know if it's a million dollars a month or a million dollars a year on just his health. Oh yeah. That's that's amazing, you know. And then for him to just be. For him to play at that level every year in and year out, you know, last night, he, you know, he, he got over 35,000 points now, but um, I think he's like number third, number three in scoring, I believe. Three or, three or four. He passed Jordan. So he passed Jordan now. So I know he's like got Jabbar, Malone, and him, I believe. But um, I'm like, man, so 35,000 points. They still lost. You know, we're missing, we're missing 80 right now. But that's okay. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be ready for the playoffs. The Nets look strong, and that was without KD. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's amazing. Again, it's just amazing what how they can continue to develop and and up their game. And it's such. Again, I think it's a testimony to how much they love the game. How much yeah. I believe. You know, um, I always tell the kids. You know. If you, if you really want to do it, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. If it's important to you, you're going to figure out a way to do it. If it's not important to you, you're going to find an excuse. If it's important to you that you want to be the best 100-meter uh, runner, the best goalie, the best you know quarterback, whatever, you're going to figure out a way to get reps. You're going to figure out a way to train. You're going to figure out a way to get things done. If it's not important... You're going to figure it out and say, hey, oh, I can't do this. I got to I got to watch TV. I got to watch my little brother. I got that. You're going to find an excuse. That's right. So um, I think you're still on the, the call thing. There we go. Um, well, man, Coach Ray, I appreciate you being on. Um, I think you're my third, fourth guest on the podcast. So hopefully in a year from now, I'll be much better at this. <laughs> um you know i appreciate you know great. you i i well, when i sat down and said who would i want to talk to i thought ray is a track guy he's going to have some valuable information um and i think you shared a ton of awesome stuff with us so i appreciate it any parting words anything you want to say to our audience before you get on to hey. whatever you got to do for today hey, yeah it was holly uh buzzed me back but hey just go out and uh, go and be great. That's all I can tell you. Don't be you great. know, you just go and be great. Be enjoy, enjoy every day because you know, enjoy every minute of breath. That's all I can say. Be blessed. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time, Coach. Thanks for being on. Um, great interview. Looking forward to working with you guys more and more on down the road. Thanks again. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you.